Peace and blessings, YouTube, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Bible Class Truth Hour here on the four-time national award-winning PET Radio. I am your minister, Brother DeAndre Hawthorne, a.k.a. Black Ice, the poet, and today we have another powerful lesson called Favor Ain't Fair. Let's go ahead and get right into our lesson for tonight. Now, we've heard the term Favor Ain't Fair, all right? It sounds so cliche, but we want to get deep into this statement and find out what it is all about when it comes to the word of God and when it comes to the Bible. What is this favor that we're talking about and why is it not so fair? We have personally witnessed people that are around us and it seems like they just keep getting blessed and they just keep getting blessed and you know everybody goes through something but Depending on your measure of faith, those things that you go through don't affect you like it may affect other people who don't have the same level of faith that you have. So it appears to other people as if, man, this person is always smiling. They're always upbeat. They don't never go through anything. And, you know, many people look at me like that on a job because I come in, I'm greeting people, I'm saying hello. I'm writing positive things on the board for my nurses that work at the hospital that I work at. So, when it comes to favor, brothers and sisters, favor is also attached to faith. I'm going to say that again. Favor is also attached to faith. So, what is favor? What does it mean? How is it defined? So we're going to look at both the world's definition of favor and we're going to look at the biblical definition of favor. So before we get into all of that, brothers and sisters, and I got mine right here. Again, I got mine right here. Go get your Bibles. Go get your pen and go get your paper. Because we got to look at the word of God and find out about this, this favor thing, brothers and sisters. So let's look at the diff dictionary definition of favor. It says beauty, charm, attractiveness from the old French favor, which means approval, praise, applause or partiality. Being blessed is one thing, but having an overflow of blessings is what the Bible defines as favor. I'm going to say that again. Being blessed is one thing, but when you have an overabundance of blessings, this is what the Bible defines as what favor is. And you saw the world's definition. It was all about you know, being beautiful, being praised, being applauded, and all those things. Let's go to the book of Psalms 103, 11 through 18. The book of Psalms 103. And we're going to read 11 through 18. Psalms 103. And we're going to read 11. Through 18, Psalms 103. And it reads, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so is great in his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembered that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourished. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant. Wait a minute. We're going to run into this everywhere in the Bible. That favor is attached. And blessings are attached. And the Lord's mercy is attached. Verse 18. To such as keep his covenant. 
and to those that remember his commandments to do them. So you can't have favor and you can't be blessed and you can't have God's mercy unless you keep his commandments. Brothers and sisters, unless you keep his covenants, it's all attached to one another. And if you go to a church that's not teaching you to keep his commandments and keep his covenants, get out of that church. Because every reward that's good, because death is a reward too, but every reward that's good is attached to doing something for God so he can do something for you. And all he wants you to do is to keep his covenants and keep his commandments. Now, we're trying to teach you how you gain favor, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. Do we really trust God, brothers and sisters, like we say we do? Do we really trust them like we say we do? Or maybe if we haven't been able to get favor, like we feel like we deserve, we should, maybe we don't have enough faith. Maybe you're only getting enough favor based on the faith that you have. Let's go ahead and go to Romans, the 12th chapter. And we're going to read verse 3. Romans, the 12th chapter. And it's verse 3. And it reads, For I say, th through, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, I want you to think about it because when we first talked about favor at the beginning of this lesson, we talked about the world's dictionary definition of what favor is. And it talks about to be likable, to be appreciated, to be applauded, to be attractive, to look at, to be looked at favorably, right? All those things deal with vain and vanity. But this right here says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So let's talk about that. Let's get into that. And for those who just tuned in, we're dealing with how favor ain't fair. So now we got the word grace that has entered into this lesson tonight. We started off talking about favor, but now grace has shown up. But grace is a cousin to favor. And both of those, grace and favor, are attached to faith. And why would you have faith if you were not willing to? To do what God asked you to do. If you understand it. If you don't understand it. That's not God's problem. The only religion known to man. That God has ever given man. Is two words. And that is. Obey me. That's it. Those, that's the only. Commandment brothers and sisters, or not commandment, but that's the only religion that God ever gave man, is obey me. So now we got grace being a cousin of favor, both favor and grace being attached to faith. And how can we have faith unless we do what he requires us to do, whether we understand it or not? And that's to keep his covenants and keep his commandments. There is nothing that we can do in deeds and in actions, brothers and sisters, to earn grace because it would never be good enough for God's grace. And that's why God calls grace a free gift. But what we can do is what he asked us to do is keep his commandments. That's the key. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2. Eight and nine. I know when we start talking about law and commandment and everything, people start running. They start changing the channel because, see, we were not given that as children. 
All we were told is, oh, all you got to do is love Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, you shall be saved. But nobody ever came and defined to us what belief in Jesus was. They just said believe in Jesus as if we just had to believe in the name. Oh, I believe in the name Jesus. But do you believe in Jesus? That's the question. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, for by grace... Are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah, you got a million dollars more than me. You can do more than me when it comes to doing charity work. You can sling your money around. You can pay for college tuition. You can send money to children in Africa to help them pay to build wells, to bring water. But what if I ain't got that kind of money? Is God going to look on you more favorable than he looks on me? If I'm doing something in my community, if I'm taking the clothes in my house and taking it to the homeless and say, hey, look, I'm putting these clothes on the table. Anybody who wears this size could get this thing. What's the difference between those who spend millions of dollars for charity and you who are doing what you can do in the eyes of God? It says right here, verse 8 again, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do any good works, brothers and sisters. It's just saying that I don't have to do the same type of works you do. You may have more resources sources than I have to do what you do. But I can do what I'm able to do. And that's why he said 10% of what you make go to your tithes. What your 10% is may be different from my 10% of your offering. And you may want to give more than your 10%. If I made $100 this month and I give $10, then I've met my requirement. And if I want to give 20, then that's 20% of what I've made for the whole month. Or however you want to cut it, slice it, or break it down, brothers and sisters. But let's look at, a, at a, an example of faith. I always love going here. When we look at the example of faith, what better example than we have than the one called Joseph, brothers and sisters. Now, y'all remember Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was held captive in Egypt by the Egyptian god Potiphar. And through his faith, he was promoted to the second in command in Egypt. He was the vice lord. Let's go to Genesis 37, 3 through 4. Genesis 37. And three through four. And it reads. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably of him. So now we're going to go down and get deep into this. Let's go to 13 and 14. And it reads. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brothers feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here I am. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee. See whether it be well with thy brethren and with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the valve of Hobron, and he came to Shechem. So basically Joseph was set up to be a snitch by his daddy to go and bring back word on whether his brothers was doing what he was supposed what they were supposed to do or not. Now, let's see how this thing all went down verses 18 through 28. We are still talking about favor, how God can turn anything that you're going through to your benefit, to your favor, and to the benefit and the favor of others. Let's read 18 through 28. We're in Genesis the 3rd chapter. It says, "And when they saw him afar off, when the brother saw Joseph, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us kill him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, 
Some evil beasts have devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brother that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites, these are Arabs, came from Gilgad with their camels bearing spicery and balm and mirth going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it that we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed Midianite merchants, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph into Egypt. That's how Joseph got into Egypt. That's how we got into Egypt, brothers and sisters. But it gets better. We're going to keep on reading. Now we got to go to Genesis, the 39 chapter. See, while in Egypt, God was still with Joseph, giving him favor. First, he was a slave working in his master's house. And then he got kicked out of his master's house. And let's find out how that happened. Genesis 39. Genesis 39. And we're going to read the first verse, Genesis 39. And the first verse, and it reads... And Joseph was brought down into Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him off the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. Now let's get deep into it. Let's go to verses 7 and 8. And it reads, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast his eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master would not want uh, what uh, with me in his house. In other words, my master would want me to do this. He says that he has committed all that he has into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph is still faithful, brothers and sisters. Let's go down and read verses 10 through 23. And it reads, And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass that she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. Then she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he has brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So she's lying against this man, Joseph. She's lying against him, saying that he tried to sleep with her when she know that he didn't. But let's see what happened at verse 15. And it came to pass when he heard that I had lifted my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, 
which she spoke unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph, Joseph's hand, all the prisoners that were in prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. That's favor. First, my brothers put me in a pit and sold me into slavery. Then I ended up into Egypt being sold to Potiphar, the, the captain, the uh, Egyptian guard. Then I got favor in his house. So then the wife lied on me. I got put into prison. Now the Lord has given me favor in prison. This goes to show you no matter what situation you are in, no matter what environment you find yourself in, God didn't say that you wouldn't go through nothing, but he is willing to give you favor even in the midst of the storm, brothers and sisters. Let's go ahead and continue reading. We got to go to verse Genesis, the 41st chapter. Let's look and see what God did to Joseph. Now, this man went from being, of course, down in a pit, his brother's plotting to kill him, sold into slavery, being a prisoner to becoming the second ruler in Egypt, only under Pharaoh himself. Pain comes before promotion. Let's go to Genesis 41. And we're going to read 1 through 7. Genesis 41, and we're going to read 1 through 7, and it reads, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin, on, uh, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So Pharaoh was thinking, what in the hell is going on? Why am I dreaming these dreams? What do they mean? What, 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 what is, is, I don't know if you believed in God at this time, but what is, am I being told out of these dreams? So let's go to verse 25, Genesis 41 and 25, and it reads, and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one dream. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. So here it is. God is showing Pharaoh what he is about to do. Let's find out what that is. Verse 38 through 43. Genesis 41. 48. I mean, I'm sorry, 38 through 43. Genesis 41, 38 through 43, and it reads, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto your word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. We're talking about favor. Favor ain't fair, brothers and sisters. The same God that parted the Red Sea can make a way for you. The same God that 
whom when Job lost all of his children and all of his possessions, did not curse God to his face and granted him a double portion of his trouble, can grant you that too, brothers and sisters. Don't be afraid to lose anything. Don't be afraid to have setbacks. Don't be afraid to fall. God got you, brothers and sisters. It is not the end. As long as there is a tomorrow for us. As long as the sun is going to shine, brothers and sisters. Then we got an opportunity to keep moving. And to go out there. And to rebound off of whatever setback that God allowed us. Now you got to keep that in mind too. God allows us to have these setbacks. Now. True favor, as I said before, at the beginning of this lesson, lesson is connected to faith, right? Now, true favor, as I, as I said before, don't mean that evil won't happen. Yeah, certain things is going to happen to you. You're going to lose some loved ones, some people who are close to you. You're going to go through financial problems, problems with your children, your health problems. Uh, true favor don't mean that you won't go through that, right? But. How can you begin to elevate unless you go through something? You keep saying, I need a breakthrough. I want a breakthrough. Well, how can you have a breakthrough unless you've been broken? Let's read the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Two verses, six and seven. Philippians four. And we're going to read two verses, six and seven. And it reads. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what is the formula here? Prayer and supplication. That's the formula, right? It said in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. First, you got to be grateful. First, you got to be thankful. Do you have enough spiritual maturity to say, thank you, God? I know that you allow me to go through this for a reason. I know that I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing in my life for a reason. So I want to say thank you in advance. I might not even know what it is. I ain't figured it out yet. But I ain't got to do that because you've already figured it out. All I got to do is be grateful, be thankful, keep, keep my prayer and my supplication up. That's it. That's the prescription, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter. Don't let your grind be smaller than your faith. Right. The reason sometimes why you haven't achieved certain things, because your faith is small. You are satisfied with the station that you are in life. But maybe God has some greater things for you. That he really wants to expose to you, but you don't have enough faith to receive it yet because you're so stuck on where you at. Well, I'm satisfied with where I'm at. I'm satisfied with just this. God want to bless you with four times more than what you have. But no, I, I, I'm good with that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm straight right where I'm at. A lot of times we kill our own blessings, brothers and sisters. Galatians, the sixth chapter, seven through ten. Galatians, the sixth chapter, seven through ten. Why don't we start saying to God, God, I appreciate where you have me right now in my life. But if it be your will that you elevate me from where I'm at right now to levels beyond comprehension of my own, then Father God, please do so if that's your will and prepare me for it. See, we got to know how to talk to God and how to speak to God and stop killing our own blessings. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses seven through 10, and it reads, be not deceived. God is not marked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap also. For he that soweth to all his flesh, shall all the flesh reap cor corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, not right now, but in due season, 
We shall reap if we not faint. Keep doing the good that you're doing. Keep giving what you've been giving. Don't give up. And it said, in due season. See, if he gave it to you right now, then you'd be like, oh, okay, cool. I did this for them. Look at what God did for me. As if he did it for you because you did it for them. No, brothers and sisters. You do expecting nothing in return. So when you don't get it back immediately, then your mind shifts its focus to, I got this because I did that. That's why God said in due season, brothers and sisters, we shall reap if we not faint. You know how it is you say, man, I'm always doing something for other people. I'm always the shoulder that people can lean on, the ear when people need a sounding board as to what they're going through. When is it going to be my turn? What about me? Who I get to go through when I'm going through something? See, brothers and sisters, that's not the right thinking because you telling me God ain't good enough for you to go to? His shoulders ain't good enough for you to lean on? That you need a man, that you need a woman, that you need a flesh and blood human being? See, other people might come to you because of their lack of faith. They may not go to God. They may go to you as if you are God's representation here on earth. But you got enough faith that you can talk to him every single day. That you can go to him every single day. You can lean on his shoulder and bend his ear. And he will listen. But we get so upset when we ain't got somebody to talk to. Ain't nobody there for me like I'm there for everybody else. You showing God that you ain't grateful. That you ain't thankful as to what he has been doing for you. Verse 10, it says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. There we go, brothers and sisters, the household of faith. Sister Key, write that down. I love that title, the household of faith. Write that down. We got to come back to that in some way. Now, when we go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, 1 through 7, we look at the patriarchs of God, and they got favor, brothers and sisters. They all had one thing in common. They kept the statues, they kept the laws, and they kept the commandments of God because they had faith. So don't say you have faith and we're not willing to keep the statues, laws, and the commandments of God. Then you, you are, you are, y'all know what I want to say, right? Hebrews 11, 1 through 7. Hebrews 11. One through seven. And it reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it, talking about faith, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do not appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before him, translation, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that come up to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he commanded the world and became heir of the righteous, which is by faith. So this whole chapter runs down those who have faith. Now, faith, again, is attached to favor. And favor is attached to grace. And all three of those things are attached to keeping the Lord's statutes, laws, and commandments. Now, speaking of Lord, Noah, brothers and sisters, what separated him from everybody else during the time of in which he lived, because remember, Noah was the one who was chosen. And his sons and their wives, eight people, but 
What separated Noah from all the other people that was on earth at that time? That God would show him favor and his household favor. Let's go to Genesis 6, 5 through 8. Genesis 6, 5 through 8. And it reads, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I would destroy man and I have cre whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, brothers and sisters, because he kept those statues, those laws, and those commandments, brothers and sisters. Yes. And some people say, well, we didn't get statues, laws, and commandments until Moses came. Well, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, I can read where they made fig leaves to cover themselves. Why didn't they just kill an animal and use the skin and the fur from an animal to cover them? Because that's what God did. It said he used coats of skin to cover their private parts. Well, how come they couldn't kill an animal? Because thou shalt not kill was a law and a commandment that was in place. Therefore, they knew they couldn't kill anything in God's creation. And so even when it came to their food, they ate fruits and they ate vegetables because no animal could be killed. And so after sin entered into God's creation. So the first life that was killed in God's creation was that animal that God killed. To use the skin and the fur to cover the private parts of Adam and Eve. Because when sin happens, blood has to be shed, brothers and sisters. Now see, I know some of y'all are going to go back and let, let me go back and read that in the book of Genesis. What Brother Black Eyes is saying. We teach that on this show, on this um, Bible class, brothers and sisters. Now, when you desire favor, grace, mercy... There must be belief. Belief is based on faith. Faith is based on the word of God and keeping the commandments, brothers and sisters. Let's read it. Let's go to John 14, 12 through 17. John 14. Twelve through 17. And it reads. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, this is Jesus talking. Is the pastor bigger than Jesus? Is mama bigger than Jesus? The ones who told you that you don't have to keep the commandments no more? We under grace? When you don't have to keep the commandments? Are they bigger than Jesus? Because Jesus is telling you, if you love me, keep my commandments. And remember, everything that Jesus gets comes from the Father. So the father gave the commandments to Jesus. Jesus gave the commandments to Moses when he was in his spiritual form. And he was called the word at that time or I am or Jehovah or Lord God. He, he, he did what he was instructed to do by the father. So Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So again, favor is attached to those things, brothers and sisters. Now. We want favor, but we don't want the obligation that comes with gaining the favor. 
right? How many of us have claimed that we know God and that we love God? And we have our own definition of what knowing God is and loving God is. But to know and to love God, that has to be defined for us who consider ourselves Christians. Has anybody ever defined to you what believing God is, what believing in God is, what knowing God is, what loving God is? Well, let's define it for you. Let's go to 1 John 2, 3 and 6. 1 John 2, we can do a whole lesson on that. What does it mean to believe in God, to know God, and to love God? 1 John 2. Three through six, it says, and hereby we do know that we know him if that's a condition. And I was always taught that if you want to know both uh, definitions of a sentence, just read the sentence backwards. So let's read this verse forward. And let's read it backwards. It says, Verse three, and hereby we do know we know him if we keep his commandments. So let's reverse it. If we don't keep his commandments, we don't know him. How do you know you know God? By keeping his commandments. How do you know you love God? By keeping his commandments. How do you know you believe in God? By keeping his commandments. Verse four, he that saith, I know him. And keep of not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God. So what happens if you don't keep his word? You don't have the love of God in you. Reversing the verses. Verse 5, but whosoever keepeth this word in him verily is the love of God. So if you don't keep the word, you don't have the love of God in you. It says perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So, and let me end with, with verse 7. It said, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. But an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. So ain't no new commandments. The same commandments that were there from the book of Genesis is still here today. The only law that Jesus came to replace is written in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, which is the law of animal sacrifice. Ain't no more sacrificing animals for sin because the animal couldn't take away sin. It could only cover the sin. But now Jesus who came and replaced the law of animal sacrifice and replaced that with the sacrificing of his own flesh and blood, now your sins can not only be covered, but, but can, can be also forgiven, brothers and sisters, where there is no more remembrance of them. And so when we talk about favor, brothers and sisters, and how it is not fair, and we didn't even get into once you get married, when a man founded the wife, he founded the good thing, and he obtains favor in the Lord. Yeah, brothers and sisters, that part, that part right there, that's true too. And so we want to continue doing what he requires of us to do here. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So I don't care what pastor say. I don't care what you've been told. I don't care what you've been taught. I don't care what you think and I don't care what you believe. The only thing that's important is what we can read out of this word. And that's why we always say that if you cannot read it, then do not believe it. Let's go ahead and close this thing out in Numbers, the sixth chapter. The book of Numbers, the sixth chapter. And let's read what the Lord wants us to know. 
for those of us who have faith and want favor. Numbers, the sixth chapter, verse 22 through 27. It says, um, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, And we're going to bless you tonight, those who are watching today's broadcast, and say, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's Bible class Truth Hour here on the four-time national award-winning POET radio. I want to say to those who are on YouTube, thank you for watching and listening and tuning in. And I pray that this lesson was a blessing for you. Thank you so much. If you want to be added to our text message invite reminder list, then text your name and the keywords Truth Hour to 312-719-7310. Again, 312-719-7310. And let me put this in the comment section. There you go. And it should be showing up. And also, brothers and sisters, if you have a Facebook page, Truth Hour, TV on YouTube, then go and join our Facebook page. That's where we go live at every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's called the Truth Hour Bible Class. The Truth Hour Bible Class. And for those who are on Facebook Live right now, go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Truth Hour TV. Thank you so much, YouTube. Peace and blessings in Jesus' name.